Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for this uh, new uh, tax talks. Uh, welcome to Paris and uh, happy to be with you. We have uh, again almost the whole team to update you on the latest development in the area of international taxation. Uh, let me uh, start uh, by inviting you to post your questions. We have received a few already, uh, but uh, as many questions as you want will be welcome and we'll try to address them. You have the address right now on the screen. Uh, we will go today through uh, the latest development of the international agenda and in particular on the BEPS project. Uh, we are moving to implementation. We had the meeting of the inclusive framework for BEPS implementation last week in the Netherlands. I will not even try to pronounce the name of the city, but it was very nice with good weather and, uh, and many, many participants. So we will update you on this and, and what the output of the meeting uh, was, or where actually, because there were a number of outputs. Uh, we will uh, then uh, just make a quick point on the multilateral instrument uh, that uh, was presented and there was a dedicated tax talks or webcasts on the MLI. If you want to see it, you can uh, actually uh, watch it. Uh, um, it's on, on, our, on our website, but we'll try to share with you what's next in this area, in particular a software which will facilitate the matching of the reservations from uh, the different uh, countries. Uh, then we'll move to tax transparency. Monica Batia, the head of the Global Forum, will uh, talk for the first time in the tax talks on the outcome of the peer review, the fast track procedure of the uh, Global Forum, which took place in Panama a few weeks ago, or last week or two weeks ago. Uh, and uh, this is quite important because this will feed the G20. And you may have heard about a list which was requested from the OECD. The outcome of this peer review is quite critical for this exercise, so we want to brief you properly on this. And we'll also do a quick update on the automatic exchange of information the common transmission system and the state of play in this area. And we'll end up with the uh, next steps. Let me move to uh, the latest development. You will see that it's quick and fast. We have uh, two main items there. One is 2017 is the year of implementation. Implementation on the front of transparency, implementation on the front of BEPS, and also I would say implementation on the front of tax policy. You know that we started work on um, the uh, tax certainty project, also more work on, on tax policy on inclusive growth and so, but on tax certainty, we have now delivered our report to the G20. You will remember that we presented it in the run-up to the Baden-Baden G20 finance ministers meeting. This report will be acknowledged by the leaders of the G20, and that's uh, the other uh, element on this slide, the upcoming G20 uh, summit, which will take place on the 8 and 9 or 7 and 8 of July. I mean, next week, at the end of next week in Hamburg, and uh, tax remains pretty high. It may not be the hot topic uh, or the warm topic to talk about climate change, which may be uh, the main source of, of uh, uh, talks in the G20, but tax remains there and pretty high. Uh, and, and what we will be reporting to the G20 leaders is about the implementation of the Agenda on Transparency, the implementation of BEPS, but also a plan to monitor the implementation on tax certainty. Um, as I mentioned to you, we had this meeting, uh, and, and I promise this is the Netherlands that you can see in pictures with the beautiful weather and the, the blue sea, the North Sea. Uh, and uh, this meeting was pretty uh, good and interesting. Good because we welcome the, uh, the 100th member of the inclusive framework. Vietnam delivered the letter of commitment to the inclusive framework at that meeting and attended the meeting together with another 82 or 83 delegations from countries. Pretty impressive if you think of it. 100 members, more than uh, 80 participants uh, to the meeting, high-level participants, very committed. And my takeaway from the meeting was that 
it's working. Uh, and that was not that obvious that bringing that many countries in the room would not turn it into something a bit formal, which would not be a working group. I promise you that this is a working group, uh, and, and, and this was quite conducive of exchanges and, and building an agenda for the future. More than 200 uh, delegates and uh, seven international organizations or regional tax organizations participated so that uh, we, we, we now spread all over the world uh, the BEPS work, uh, and that means that more than 95% of the world economy has now committed and is implementing BEPS. Uh, this meeting was about identifying the next steps of the work, the standard setting work, the work on the digital economy, and also taking stock of the progress. The output of that uh, meeting will be a report to the G20 that uh, will be presented, which will be presented in Hamburg uh, next week. So uh, we, again, took stock of the uh, progress on the implementation of the BEPS package. We did uh, take stock of the establishment of the peer reviews and the start of the peer reviews have started. We'll come back to this later in the presentation to indicate when the peer reviews will be delivered, the first reports will be delivered. And uh, we also uh, agreed on uh, what will be done uh, in the standard setting area. And we agreed an annual report, or report which may become annual, on where we stand, what countries have done, what the inclusive framework has done too. Uh, I will stop here in terms of introduction and we'll move now to uh, the multilateral instrument. We, we will be uh, very quick because we have this dedicated webcast which already took place. So if you want the technicalities of the MLI from the team, the explanation of the technicalities of the MLI from the team, go and see that webcast. But we wanted to share with you and we hope it's going to work. It's going to be live, the testing of uh, the software which will allow you to match the, the different um, uh, reservations or the different uh, amendments uh, to the bilateral treaties through, through the MLI. So I'm turning now to Michael Evers, who is going to present uh, this tool. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pascal. Um, indeed, we, we've all already seen the bigger numbers. We see them here on the screen with the 70s, uh, 67 signatories covering 68 jurisdictions, already covering a third of the existing treaty network, but also with more than a thousand treaties already waiting for a match. So there's a lot of information out there in the form of the MLI positions that we have published on our website um, in the form of PDFs, but shortly we will be making available uh, a beta version, a preliminary version of a matching database that we have been developing in the Secretariat, but together with the countries. And we can give you uh, a sneak preview of what it will look like and what will be available in a couple of weeks. So if we switch to uh, that database, and I hope it's, it's visible for you, there it is. Um, we will have all the signatories in that database. So of course, starting with, with, with the A, and there is no treaty between Andorra and itself. That makes sense. So let's have a look at uh, the United Kingdom, because we had a chair from the United Kingdom. but they don't have a treaty with Andorra, so that would show up that it would not be a covered tax agreement, so that would be something for the bilateral work. But if we uh, would, for example, look at the changes to the treaty with uh, the Netherlands that kindly hosted our uh, meeting in Noordwijk, then we see um, that indeed this agreement, uh, agreement between those two countries would be a covered tax agreement. And in that way, you can go through all the, the treaties, see if there is a match, and also see what would be the modification uh, treaty by treaty. Uh, of course, it's quite clear to see that in, in green there will be modifications. Um, in, in other cases, there will not be modifications as a result of the MLI positions taken by the two countries and their interaction. The interaction um, is basically uh, projected by this database itself. So to show that it's really um, interactive, if we would look at another country pair, like New Zealand, you see that the uptake is even higher, uh, there's even more, more green, um, and that is what you can all explore through the database. You can also look at the underlying data. If you want to see why, in this case, uh, Article 8 of the MLI would not apply between those uh, countries, you can look into that data and analyze it. It's more for the technicians, but you would see that this treaty is probably a bit older and doesn't have uh, articles to notify. So then you can also explore why certain provisions are amended and others aren't. 
Um, we are working with countries currently to get all the data uh, in, in the database in the correct way. We're checking over 150,000 data points. We're doing, we're doing that as quickly as possible, and we hope to uh, have the database online as early as possible in July. Okay, microphone, pressing the button, very important. Um, we are now moving on, and I think we should come back from the multilateral instrument uh, to the PowerPoint. Um, I hope this is coming uh, to the peer reviews of the BEPS minimum standards. There we go, perfect. Thank you, Michael. Technology is everything. Um, and I'm going to focus on action five. I'm going to focus on action 14, and I'm also going to focus on action 13. And on 13, I'm going to go a little wider because other things have happened. They go beyond uh, the peer review. So if we start with action five just briefly, then here you see a chart that gives you a sense of where we stand right now. Um, and so, so the total part or the total number of regimes that we've identified in the process, and it doesn't mean that they pose a problem, but that's the one that we're looking at, it's about 125. It's a dynamic process, so this process can evolve more, can be added over time as they become relevant, but this is the current stock of regimes that we're looking at. We've broken this down in color so you can sort of see the sorts of regimes. Not every regime is in the scope of FHTP. It needs to be geographically mobile, including financial services and the provision of intangibles. So that's the scope, so it's not everything. But within those, you see the regime types that we're looking at, starting with a very significant category of the 31. That's the IP regimes, the intellectual property regimes. You know that a number of those have been identified already in the 2000. And 15 report, and that's the OECD countries, the G20 countries, but also now including all the new inclusive framework members. And then you can take it down, headquarters, financing, leasing, banking, insurance, service, shipping, holding, others, and then we have a dual category. And the dual category, simply to explain that, it's a relatively sizable category. It's not a completely different one. In fact, it is where countries provide aspects of those other types of regimes, but in one regime. So it may have features of service and distribution. It may have features of financing and leasing. So those we look at with respect to the aspect, we look at the aspect, we discuss the aspect, we come to conclusions, and then we move to the next aspect. Now, the question you might ask, well, that's all interesting, but when do I see the result of the final? Findings. Well, some of the results of the findings you're going to see in the report that's going to be released shortly. Others should be coming after the summer. And then, as we've always done it in FHDP, there will be regular updates so that everybody knows whether a particular regime is no problem, whether it's harmful, whether it's potentially harmful, what changes will be made to the regime. So we will be reporting out on that shortly with respect to what we've done so far and certainly after the summer with the next installment. Now then, moving to the second part of FHTP, that is the spontaneous exchange of information on rulings. Some term this automatic exchange, we've called it mandatory spontaneous exchange. That's the second part of FHTP. There's the regime work, there's the exchange of the ruling. Here are the relevant steps that I think I have gone through at the last webcast. I'm not going to go through all of those. There's a number of documents, it's agreed, the peer review process is proceeding, the timing you know and it also applies to the new members. Perhaps just throwing it out in terms of the context, where are we? Well, first of all, rulings are being exchanged already. Thousands of rulings have been exchanged and rulings are being exchanged as we speak. It's the relevant information on the ruling that's being exchanged. If you then want the whole ruling, you request that ruling. And then there's a process. We will publish the results of the first round of peer reviews beginning of next year with respect to this year. It's gonna be the OECD countries and the G20 countries that were around, and then we're gonna move more and more countries into the peer review process, allowing a possibility for developing countries to defer given that they're new and recognizing capacity constraints that they have. Then let me move uh, to the next action, and that's action 14. Now, action 14 on dispute resolution, another part of the minimum standard. That is the peer review of the MAP process. That's not arbitration. That's a, a commitment voluntary going beyond it and also included in the MLI as an optional provision. But here it's the peer review of the MAP process. As you can see here in green on the left-hand side, the first six have been approved at the level of the forum. They need to go through the approvals process and we will then publish them. The next seven are in process. And on the third batch, if you wish, the ones on the 7th of July, we're currently looking for taxpayer input, as we always do when we move to a new batch. So that's the status of where we are on 
the uh, review in terms of what to expect, because that's nice to have an internal process, but when do you see the outcomes sitting on the outside, importantly, well, you're going to see batch one and batch two reports. So that's the first six and then the second seven. You're going to go and see those published in 2017. Of course, the batch one will come first and then we go to the batch two. And in 2018, you're going to have batch three to five reports. So you can see that all of this is available on the website. The methodology, the process, the schedule, all of this is um, available. And again, if you are uh, concerned with MAP, if you have experience, please provide the input in time for the peer reviews process. There's particular aspects that only taxpayers know. We need to know them, so please submit your views. And then I come to the last aspect, which is action 13. Uh, the different aspects here, starting not just with the peer review, but also talking about the guidance. Not gonna go through all of those aspects. Um, we have issued guidance in April on a number of aspects. It's very important that we start consistently, that we continue consistently, and that we end on a consistent basis. So when the information comes in, tax administration understand the information. It's the same information that comes in from different MEs around the world. So that's why we are uh, very open to issuing guidance when there is a request by business to do so. And I think we've worked closely also with business that ultimately has to fill in the CDC template to make sure it's consistent. We've also issued in May updates on where we are on the implementation, on the activations, on the number of exchange relationships. And of course, we've also worked with countries that have early filing deadlines to make sure that this whole system moves forward and we don't have local filing where countries haven't had the chance to file in the jurisdiction of the parent. Um, then overall, and I guess moving further in CBC reporting, uh, where are we as a snapshot in terms of its implementation? I think it's proceeding extremely well and extremely fast, recognizing that we've only approved this very, very recently. You see this on the slide, about 55 jurisdictions have taken steps to implement CBC filing obligations on m and &E groups. 30 are essentially done and going beyond the minimum standard also to the master and the local file for information. There's 38 jurisdictions that are also implementing an obligation to submit a master and the local file, which is not part of the minimum standard, a recommendation. Moving from domestic then to international, where are we on the international side? We have about uh, slightly over 850 bilateral exchange relationships. You can find them on our website. Have a look. And this is, again, a dynamic process. The first exchanges will happen no later than June of 2018. So still there is time for those exchanges. So we're starting and they're building up quickly. Last week, I think, as Pascal might have mentioned, we had another signing ceremony in the margins of the meeting in the Netherlands where now uh, the number of signatories on the multilateral competent authority agreement has gone up to 64. And progress, you would have seen with the press release, is also being made on the bilateral side, where the US has now signed a number of uh, uh, bilateral country-by-country -country competent authority agreement, and that number is likely to increase quickly moving forward. Um, the last point on CBC reporting is that we are also working quite specifically um, with an action plan on uh, developing countries and how do we make sure that they can benefit from the CBC reporting. You see the six blocks of the action plan we have written out. We're working closely with developing countries that were in uh, the Netherlands and we're working through those blocks to make sure that this is something uh, that everybody can benefit from, including and in particular also developing countries. That's, I think, the last work on the peer review, and I give it to the Thank you, Akim. Just before uh, turning to the standard setting uh, part of the work, just to remind you that last week the inclusive framework met. The inclusive framework is the Committee on Fiscal Affairs with all the uh, committed countries on an equal footing. Uh, they agreed this report to the G20, which will be made public sometime next week. We don't exactly know the date yet, but uh, sometime next week, the annual report of the inclusive framework, which tries to identify and assess the impact of the PEPs work on the behavior of companies and, and tax administrations, uh, will be released. So that was one part of the work. The other part of the work, as explained by Akim, was to agree uh, and move forward the peer reviews. And as you will have seen, the uh, peer reviews will be made public when they are agreed. A lot of peer reviews on harmful tax practices, good progress on CBCR, and we're working on the template of the report. 
Uh, and uh, on Action 14, you will have seen that the first batch of reviews will be made public very soon. As Arim said, and as I very often ask for, we need your input. You know about uh, the schedule of the review, so we need your input on the countries which will be reviewed. Uh, and uh, finally, on Action 6, which is related to the minimum standard on treaty shopping, we will start the peer review later on because we did want to give a chance to countries to update their treaty networks. The signing of the MLI was massive. Uh, 68 territories covered, 67 uh, uh, signatories, but this is not the end of it. We have another countries uh, uh, which stand ready to sign soon. Soon being by the end of the week, probably on Friday or, or Thursday, uh, we will have uh, Mauritius, which will be signing the um, uh, MLI, which is good news. We are looking forward to this event. The last part of the work of the inclusive framework was about looking forward on the standard setting and in particular uh, agreeing the public release of uh, discussion drafts on allocation of profit uh, to permanent establishment and on profit split. So you will have a point now uh, with uh, Melinda and Myra on these two discussion drafts, the content and also the schedule in terms of comments uh, for you, uh, so that you're all set uh, before commenting. So I'm turning now to Melinda. Thanks very much, Pascal. Yes, uh, last week was a very busy week. One of the two revised discussion drafts uh, that we released was on uh, the transactional profit split method. Uh, as you would expect, this discussion draft builds on the existing uh, OECD transfer pricing guidelines, but we've also tried to take account of the many, many comments we received from you on the discussion draft on the same topic that we released last year. The first part of the discussion draft uh, identifies a number of indicators that might point you in the direction of a transactional profit split method. Perhaps the clearest indicator that we identify is, involves a scenario where each of the parties is making a unique and valuable contribution. Another indicator that we identify is perhaps a little harder to pin down, uh, but this is a scenario where uh, there's such a high degree of integration of the business operations uh, that it makes it rather difficult uh, to evaluate the contribution of any one party in isolation uh, from the contributions of others. Uh, and the last indicator that I wanted to mention uh, involves scenarios where each of the parties uh, shares the economically significant risks that are associated with that transaction. And of course, these indicators are not mutually exclusive. We can and do see situations where uh, two or even three of these indicators uh, coexist. The next part of the draft uh, tries to answer the question of what are the profits that should be split. Uh, and this is important because, of course, we're talking about a transactional profit split method, so we need to identify what are the profits that relate to those transactions. And in this part of the draft, we try to refine one of the key concepts that we introduced in last year's discussion draft uh, relating to the distinction between profit splits of anticipated profits and profit splits of actual profits. And we go on to say that this distinction should be based on the actual transaction, the nature of the actual transaction, and in particular, the extent to which the parties share economically significant risks in that transaction. Lastly, the draft considers a number of profit splitting factors, and these are the, the very important proxies, if you like, for value creation or value <coughs> contribution being made by each of the parties. And we round out the draft uh, with a number of examples. As you can see at the top of your screen there, we have a, a period for written comments which is open until the 15th of September. Uh, and we have a p public consultation, we're expecting to hold a public consultation in November. And of course we welcome your comments on, on any aspect of this draft, uh, but there are a number of particular questions that we are um, extremely interested to hear your views on, uh, which you can see on the screen now. Uh, the first of these particular questions relates to this issue around profit splits of anticipated profits or profit splits of actual profits. Next up, we have a series of questions relating to profit splitting factors, and in particular things like uh, headcount uh, and capital or capital employed, and when these sorts of profit splitting factors might be appropriate as measures of value created or value contributed. We also have a question in there uh, about adjustments to profit splitting factors. For instance, if, whether we should be adjusting for things like different purchasing power in different countries, where we have profit splitting factors uh, being contributed by um, different kinds of countries. 
Lastly, we are always after some additional examples. We find that, that they can be very helpful to illuminate the principles that we are trying to espouse. So uh, if you have uh, had experience in, in using a profit split method successfully, whether that be in, uh, in an advanced pricing arrangement or in any other scenario, and in particular if the basis for that profit split uh, was the high degree of integration that occurred in those transactions, we would be very, very interested uh, to hear from you. And with that, I will turn it over to Myra. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, last week, the Inclusive Framework also approved the public release of a second discussion draft, this one on the attribution of profits to permanent establishments. And as for the discussion draft on profit split, the deadline for uh, comments will be the 15th of September. And we also intend to have a public consultation in November this year. You might ask yourself what's new from the previous discussion draft that we published last year, also in July, compared to this one. I think the most important thing is we've taken a different approach. And this different approach is focusing now on developing high-level principles that should govern the attribution of profits to permanent establishments. So we have moved away from the uh, more numerical and prescriptive uh, uh, examples that we had uh, in the previous discussion draft. Um, very important is that um, these high-level principles have been agreed by countries who apply the AOE and the non-AOE uh, the, the AOE and the non-AOE approach. This is the author the uh, authorized OECD approach that is contained in Article Seven of the Model Tax Convention. Um, and so countries agree that these uh, high-level principles will be applicable and relevant when uh, profits need to be attributed to a permanent establishment. Um, if we uh, uh, also th move on to what are the key uh, principles, um, the first one and most important is that uh, no double taxation should occur in the source uh, in the source country as a result of the application of Article Seven and Article Nine. As you may know, there. Um, cases where there is a uh, uh, dependent agent permanent establishment arising from the application of paragraph 5 of Article 5 of the Model Tax Convention, where the intermediary and the non-resident enterprise are related parties. And when that happens, both Article 7 and Article 9 will come into play to determine the profits that will be taxed in the source country. Therefore, in those circumstances, countries have agreed that when both articles are applicable, there should not be double taxation arising there. Accordingly, when that happens, they have committed to ensure that uh, such double taxation is eliminated and that no matter uh, whether the sequence of application of Article 7 and Article 9, that should not have an impact on the amount of profits uh, over which the uh, source country has the right to tax. Also, we address the relationship between Article 5, Article 7, and Article uh, 9. Uh, what we say is that the allocation of risk that we, do on, uh, that we do for Article 9 purposes will not impact the existence of a permanent establishment under Article 5, because any allocation of risk under Article 9 is only for transfer pricing purposes. Also, what we say is that when under Article 9 a risk is found to be assumed by the intermediary, that same risk cannot be attributed then under Article 7 either to the permanent establishment or to the non-resident enterprise. Um, another uh, point in which uh, countries agree is that uh, the fact that the intermediary is paid an arm's length compensation that does not uh, exhaust the uh, taxing rights of the source country. Um, the level of profitability of the PE in the source country will be determined by the facts and circumstances of each case. Finally, the draft also accepts um, the, the fact that countries can adopt within their domestic legislation approaches to simplify compliance when both Article 7 and Article 9 are applicable. Before I uh, pass on the floor to Dr. Pross, I would like to point out that um, you still have some days left uh, if you wish to submit comments on the discussion draft that we published on the 23rd of May, uh, which contain uh, proposed implementation guidance on the approach for how to value intangibles. So you have until Friday, and we, um, we look forward to hear your input. And finally, I also want to inform you for those of you eager to see the 2017 edition of the TPG, that that will be available uh, early July. So I invite you to look at the OECD library uh, bookstore and 
go ahead and check it out. Thank you, Myra. Just a note before turning to uh, the issue of hybrids. Indeed, the transfer pricing guidelines will be updated. It's a very important update as it incorporates uh, some of the BEPS work. So we will make that public uh, sometime next week, too, uh, so that you can have a, uh, an interesting summer reading the, this update. Uh, in case you want uh, to add to your interesting summer, uh, some news on the hybrid mismatches. Arim. Thank you. Yes, Herr Dr. Pross will take you through branch mismatches in less than two minutes because otherwise Pascal will take away my microphone. Um, so on branch mismatches, um, uh, first of all, yes, there were some complaints when we did the first report. It was 450 pages. So this time around, while you haven't seen it, you will shortly see it. We made sure it was not 100 pages. In fact, it's only 99 pages. So we have achieved at least a reduction in paper. It's something for the summer. Uh, but joke apart, what does it actually do? It recognizes that the same policy outcomes that people were concerned about with respect to hybrid entities or hybrid instruments can also arise in the context of a branch. One country sees a branch, the other one doesn't see a branch. Can have the same planning consequences, can have the same undesired outcomes, hence the same impetus for countries to apply the same approaches and work through those issues, which they have now done. So what does it do? It sets out the domestic law recommendations for changes that bring uh, the outcomes in line with action two. We don't want to have a situation where because you can't do an instrument, now you do a hybrid branch and we have the same problems. The idea is that we solve the issue, not we displaced it from one structure to another structure. And also importantly, um, in particular for those in Europe, it brings consistency with the treatment of hybrids, branch mismatches, and also the already adopted European legislation under ATAD 1 and ATAD 2. I'm not going to take you through the timeline. You can see the timeline. Uh, the important piece is the piece that hasn't happened, which is when will it be released? We expect it is approved, so it's just a question of release, which we expect to happen in July. All of the glorious 99 pages. Now, the next slide I will not speak to. I will just tell you what it is. It tries to condense everything you need to know. Never dare to ask about hybrid mismatches in one slide. It shows you what is the rule for a branch mismatch under the report um, that you have, uh, what is the new one, what is the primary response, and then over on the other side to the right, it also show you how the recommendation of the existing report, the new one hybrid uh, branches, and then how this relates to ATAT2 that you see, so you can also see there's policy coherence, you come to the same outcomes under the OECD framework as under the EU framework. I think that's all I wanted to say on the branch mismatches and it's moving to tax transparency. Thank you, thank you, Akim. Uh, we're moving to the other branch of our work related to 2017 as the year of the implementation. You will remember that last year in April, uh, we had some uh, press and a lot of noise around what was called the Panama Papers, rightly or wrongly. Uh, some countries were not happy that it would be called the Panama Papers, or one country was not happy, uh, because a number of other countries were indeed involved uh, in these papers. Uh, as a result of that, a number of countries said it's time to gear up the implementation of the transparency standards. And the G20 at that time mandated the OECD to do more work on beneficial ownership, this is ongoing, but also to identify the countries where progress would not be sufficient. And uh, what has happened since is extremely interesting, as countries have moved, has, have rushed to update their legislation in terms of access to the information, in terms of exchange of information, instruments, as well as in terms of availability of the information. And what we proposed to the G20 was to report to them to the upcoming summit in Hamburg where countries would stand. But it was a question of fairness to also recognize the progress made by countries which rushed last year to do what they were asked to do, so that we would not report 
on outdated information. That would be extremely unfair because the global form reviews take from six to eight months uh, that uh, it would take too much time to report on time on the uh, updated information uh, and updated legislation. This is why the global forum did put in place what we've called a fast track procedure to take stock of all the progress made so that when we report to the G20, which is happening today, actually, we will be sending the report of the Secretary General of the OECD, which annexes the inclusive framework report, as well as the global forum report. When we will report later today, we will report on the updated information, the updated legislation, uh, so that uh, the G20 will just identify the jurisdictions or jurisdiction, there may be only one, uh, which uh, have not met sufficient progress to fully meet uh, their commitments. So Monica is going to drive you through what has happened and what the outcome of the peer reviews through the fast track uh, has been. Uh, so Monica, I'm turning to you. Uh, thank you very much, Pascal, for that introduction to the background on why the Global Forum has gone in for what we call a fast-track procedure. <clears throat> now, the fast-track procedure is a special procedure. It's not a full-fledged peer review. Uh, the pr purpose of this procedure was to allow the jurisdictions to demonstrate progress in time for the July 2017 G20 Leaders Summit. Uh, in this process, the objective was that the Global Forum should be able to assess what would have been the outcome had a full peer review taken place now. So based on that assessment, a provisional rating was assigned to the jurisdictions, and, uh, uh, and that provisional rating is what will feed into the report to the G20 leaders, which Pascal spoke about. So this fast track process was, was based on peer inputs uh, and, and approved by the Global Forum, uh, but the only difference was there was no on-site as we do in the normal reviews. So the position uh, before we started the fast track procedure is there before you on the slide. Uh, you see 67% of jurisdictions were largely compliant, that is 77. Uh, there were about 19% or 22 jurisdictions that were fully compliant. Uh, there were about five jurisdictions that were rated as non-compliant, um, 12 jurisdictions partially compliant, and in addition, there were about four other jurisdictions which had moved to a, the phase two of the review too late uh, so that they did not have a rating. So, so many of these jurisdictions, of course, were eligible for the fast-track review. So following the uh, fast track review, the results of which were discussed by the peer review group of the Global Forum in the meeting we held two weeks ago in Panama. And following that, these results have been adopted by the Global Forum and you have the results in front of you in the chart. And uh, what these results demonstrate is that jurisdictions have actually made substantial progress in, in bringing about the changes that they were required to do and these are changes both to their legal frameworks as well as to their practices for actual exchange of information. As a result, you'll see that one jurisdiction which was non-compliant actually remained non-compliant, so, so the success rate is very high. There was one non-compliant jurisdiction which improved and found a provisional rating of partially compliant. There were seven partially compliant jurisdictions that improved their rating to largely compliant. Uh, even better, there were three non-compliant jurisdictions that improved their rating to largely compliant, and three jurisdictions which were not rated at all previously also received a provisional rating of largely compliant. So you have before you all the results of the fast track, and these are all the provisional ratings that are there. So following the results of the fast track, you see the complete picture now of where jurisdictions stand in terms of their ratings. If you see the columns there in blue are the ratings that were assigned in the, as part of the full-blown peer review in the first round of reviews. In the red are the provisional ratings. So you can see a large number of jurisdictions received a provisionally rating of largely compliant and added to the 77. There are about 90% jurisdictions that are largely compliant and there are 19% uh, that are uh, fully compliant. So a lot of progress there, and this progress is not based on, uh, on a quick 
uh, analysis, but it's based on a very robust process. Many jurisdictions have ended their bank secrecy. Many jurisdictions have improved access to information. The actual practices of exchange of information have also improved. Many more jurisdictions signed the multilateral convention or improved their exchange relationships, and many jurisdictions ended bearer shares. So we saw that the call from the G20 to make progress has actually resulted in substantial and tangible progress on the ground. So moving on from there to the progress on the other limb of work that we are doing, that is the automatic exchange of information. Uh, the Global Forum is fully into looking and focusing at implementation. Uh, we are very excited about the first exchanges that will take place a few weeks from now, this September, which will be 50 jurisdictions exchanging information, those that are committed to 2017 exchange of information. So the main uh, building blocks for implementing the common reporting standard include domestic legislation, for requiring the banks and financial institutions to, to do due diligence and collect information about non-resident taxpayers. As you see on, on the slide there, for the 2017 jurisdictions, they're completely on track. All the legislation is in place, and they're all ready and hooking on to the common transmission system, which is the transmission system which will actually exchange that information. And I will bring in Dr. Pross in a while to explain to you about the common transmission system. So these jurisdictions are actually on track, and, and as I said, we're all excited about the first exchanges that are going to take place. As far as the 2018 jurisdictions are concerned, uh, an overwhelming majority of them also have their domestic legislation already in place. Even as we speak, many parliaments are improving legislation or approving legislation. So there is a tremendous progress for 2018 jurisdictions as well, and we hope to see that completed very soon. The second limb of, or the second block of implementing the common reporting standard is the international legal framework, which includes the multilateral convention as a, as a legal framework. Uh, coupled with that is the multilateral competent authority agreement, uh, and some jurisdictions are actually entering into bilateral competent authority agreements, which com complement the, the, either the multilateral convention or a bilateral agreement or a bilateral treaty between two countries. So as you see there on, on the slide, there are about 111 uh, countries or jurisdictions which are now participating in the multilateral convention, and there are 14 more that have already asked to join, and in the pipeline there are many more who will probably ask to join that. Uh, and of course, there are 100 jurisdictions committed to the common reporting standard, but when you see the signatories, which are obviously 111, and there are many more, which means that the, uh, the impact of the multilateral convention is beyond and far ahead or further than those that are committed to the common reporting standard. For the common reporting standard competent authority agreement, the multilateral one, there are 92 signatories and there are many more that are joining in. The third limb I want to mention about the implementation of the common reporting standard is that countries and jurisdictions are required to have a very robust confidentiality framework which gives assurance to their partners that the information that they're going to receive under the common reporting standard will remain secure and will be reused only for tax purposes. And for this purpose, the Global Forum on a multilateral basis has carried out evaluation of all the jurisdictions that are committed to the common reporting standard. And those results are available to the Global Forum members and they will use those results as a basis for deciding who they can exchange information uh, with. The last piece of that, which is the technical framework for uh, common reporting standard, uh, of course, jurisdictions are putting in place domestic technical um, systems to be able to receive information from financial institutions and then to be able to pass it along through the common, report, common transmission system to their treaty partners. So with that, I turn to Dr. Pross to talk about the piece of the common transmission system, which is the pipeline which will help information to be shared between treaty partners. Thank you, says Dr. Pross. Um, on the common transmission system, as Monica has said, we have agreed a standard. Countries have implemented or have committed to implement a standard. There's a lot of work on the implementation, <laughs> domestic, internationally. 
but it's beyond the legal implementation, it's also the practical information. This is ultimately IT, it's data that needs to go from A to B, so we have a schema that we've developed so people know the way the information is structured when it drops out on the other end, but we also needed to create a point from A to B to transmit the information. <laughs> it's a bilateral exchange, so the data travels from one competent authority to another competent authority, but the common transmission system standards the transmittal of that information so that those 100 countries that Monica was referring to wouldn't need to negotiate with the other 99. You do the math, it would have been a lot of negotiations. Um, as it says here, the common transmission system is intended primarily and initially for the transmission of information on financial accounts pursuant to the common reporting standard, but not only. It is also used to support the exchange disciplines within um, the BEPS actions, in particular country by country reporting and then also rulings. So that's what it's meant to support. Um, we are advanced as we should be because the first exchanges will go live in September. We are on track. Um, the conformance testing has started. The security audit is on the way. Countries are testing that it works. There's a lot of work in the background happening as we speak. We're very grateful for all those countries that help us to do this work, including in particular also the technical expertise of the European Commission. Um, let me then move to the last bit, and I think that's the last slide which we have in this roundup on where we are on transparency, the CRS disclosure facility. What is this? You follow the OECD website, so you know what it is. It's launched in May 2017 as part of an overall OECD strategy to deal with CRS avoidance schemes. It is very important that the integrity of what we're doing stays protected to the benefit of financial institutions so that their report and it makes a difference to the benefit of government so we get all the information and make sure it doesn't move from somewhere to somewhere else where we don't see it. It is, um, we are pleased to say, already delivering results. We are receiving numerous submissions from civil society, very grateful also here to civil society for the active cooperation that we see here, from people in industry, from stakeholders, from people in financial institutions that tell us the sorts of schemes that are out in the marketplace. And so you see on the slide a couple of those, in particular, for instance, the one that we highlight here is the Occupational Retirement Schemes, ORS where I guess if you see on our website, there's some swift action that Hong Kong has undertaken on those and we are in contact. And that's not the only ones. There is a couple of uh, residents by investment schemes that are being promoted as ways of getting around the CRS. There is abuse of active NFFE status. There's a couple of these things out there. I think the message that we want to send here is if you're thinking about it, don't do it. Um, it's simply because there may be a short-term gain for long-term pain. The competitive situation is such that we will find out, somebody will be in the audience, somebody is looking at the website, the competitive situation is such that other people wouldn't like these schemes around, other countries wouldn't like to have these schemes around. So if we look at it, either it's a scheme that actually doesn't even work, so don't go into it because it doesn't do anything, or it's a scheme where maybe there's inappropriate implementation of the CRS, and then we engage with the country and make sure that there is correct implementation of the CRS. And if you have 100 countries in there, that's a lot of eyes looking. And if, in fact, there was something where the standard would be insufficient, we fix it. So whichever way it goes, it's not worth to go in there. At the same time, and let me conclude by that, we do value your input. Here is um, the website, the link where you can provide information, whether it's PowerPoint presentations, as we've seen, or other information, by all means, make use of that facility. Help us together make the CRS get where we want it to get to. Thank you. Thanks, Arim. Um, I think with this presentation on transparency, you can see that uh, things are really changing. If we step back 18 months ago, something like that, uh, a number of countries had not committed to automatic exchange of information. They now have all committed to automatic exchange of information, even though there could be a question mark on, on the US, which does FATCA and doesn't reciprocate on FATCA fully, but partly with some countries. But we had five uh, financial centers last year which had not committed. They have committed to, in particular, Bahrain or Vanuatu or Lebanon or Panama. Second, on the multilateral convention on mutual assistance. We now have almost all financial centers, there are just a couple of them in the Caribbean, no, no major financial center which have not signed. All the others have signed the multilateral convention or have asked to sign. Again, 18 months ago, 
we had uh, 30 significant financial centers which had not signed nor asked to sign. Again, Panama, the United Arab Emirates, the Bahamas said we will go the bilateral route. They decided to change the approach which we should uh, command. Um, finally, on the ratings, we can see that there is only one jurisdiction left which is non-compliant, only seven which are partially compliant, and this, I think, reflects a significant progress which has been made. Is it enough? No, it's not enough. It's not enough because on the way forward, the standard uh, has become slightly more stringent with the new definition of beneficial owner uh, uh, as, as per the FATF standard that the Global Forum is going to review as well in the new set of review. And as Monica explained, those who benefited from a fast track will be first in line for an in-depth review against this new standard and in the new phase of review. And it's not enough because we now need to move to effective implementation of automatic exchange of information. We are currently assessing the legislations which have been passed to implement automatic exchange of information. We see massive progress in terms of concluding agreements. In the previous slides, you may have noticed that 92 MCAA or 92 countries and jurisdictions have signed the MCAA, the Multilateral Competent Authority Agreement. That's a lot. I mean, on 100 countries committed, there are only eight missing. One will be signing this week, Bahrain, and uh, the other seven should think of it. Well, by the way, and that's also an interesting piece of news, I think, Hong Kong and Macau will benefit from a territorial extension by China in October and therefore have already expressed the interest in joining the MCAA, which means that we'll just have four or five countries left outside the MCAA network, and I'm pretty sure that the Bahamas, because they have signed recently the multilateral convention, will move into that direction. So you can see big progress, which is also reflected in the fact that on the voluntary disclosure regimes, uh, we, we do have a lot of success in the different uh, countries uh, where taxpayers uh, have disclosed their offshore assets. The world has changed. It's a very significant change. Further work will be done on beneficial ownership in close coordination with the, with the FATF. Uh, but, but I think we need to recognize this progress. All that to say that when we will be reporting this to the G20, it may be the case that actually there are not that many, if any, jurisdictions to identify as not having made uh, sufficient progress. One could see this as a failure, not people on the list. Some others could say, well, actually, that's the goal. Uh, not to have anyone on the list as long as countries meet the standard. Well, yes, as long as we see this in a dynamic, and the dynamic here is that we move towards a uh, high, I mean, a bigger focus on the implementation of automatic exchange of information, which is ahead of us. We cannot today assess anything else but the commitment. Tomorrow, we will be able to assess the quality of the legislations and the quality of the agreements to implement automatic exchange of information. And tomorrow, in 2018, we'll be able to assess the quality of the information exchange. So if we keep that dynamic in mind, I think we can be reassured that all this progress towards transparency is still on track, thanks to uh, the work of the teams present here, but also thanks to the, uh, to the commitment of all the jurisdictions and the uh, in political interest of the G20 in this area. We will come to a conclusion so that we have a few minutes to respond to your questions. What's next, as I indicated to you, the OECD report to the G20, which will include the inclusive framework report to the G20, as well as the global forum report to the G20 to be released in the course of next week. The first exchange of information, which will start in September 2017, which will be the test of the CTS, the Common Transmission System, and we'll see what happens there between 50 countries and another 50 countries and jurisdictions will do in 2018. The, the peer review so watch our website and uh, the uh, work on transfer pricing. Please not only watch our website, but send your comments. And finally, uh, last and certainly not least, more work on the digitization of the economy and its tax consequences. You will remember that in Baden-Baden, the G20 finance ministers mandated the OECD to do an interim report by April 2018. We are working hard on this. We are engaging with the tech companies, but not, not only the tech companies, BIAC in general, uh, with a number of countries which want to take actions 
Another set of countries think that we shouldn't move too fast to take action because business models have not stabilized. So we are working on this within the framework of the task force on the digital economy. And we will do a public consultation uh, sometime in the fall, probably uh, uh, end of October or November. And we'll do this on site, if I may, which is in San Francisco in the Bay Area so that we can interact with the tech companies there. By then, we will issue a few issues notes or papers on which you will be able to comment. We're coming to an end uh, right now of this uh, webcast, but we have another six minutes uh, for Q&As. We have received a number of questions, uh, and uh, I would like uh, to turn to Melinda, as one of the questions is on something we, have, we haven't updated you on, which are the toolkits, uh, the Global Forum, the Inclusive Framework agreed a number of toolkits. Uh, so Melinda, when can we see the one on comparables? Thanks, Pascal. Yes, last week was a very busy week. Uh, and another document that was published last week was, in fact, the toolkit on uh, accessing comparables data for transfer pricing analyses. Uh, this document, and, and indeed all of the toolkits uh, that we have uh, coming up, uh, are actually a product of the Platform for Collaboration on Tax. So that's a collaboration between the OECD, uh, working together with the World Bank Group, the UN, and the IMF. Uh, the document last week was on, uh, was on comparables for, for transfer pricing analyses, uh, but also included a supplementary report on addressing information gaps uh, for minerals sold in an intermediate form. And I understand that, that, that part of the question had to do specifically with, with that uh, element of the work. Um, that uh, supplementary report set out uh, a methodology that uh, can be used to analyse the transformation chain uh, for minerals. And we look at a number of case studies. We look at uh, copper, uh, iron ore, thermal coal and gold. Uh, and, but, the, but the methodology can be applied, applied much more broadly uh, to many other kinds of, of minerals, of which, of course, there are uh, dozens and dozens out there. So the intention is uh, that, that that methodology can then be used by uh, transfer pricing um, practitioners or tax administrations when they're looking at pricing of a, a mineral that's sold in an intermediate form. And by that, we mean uh, it's sold at a stage in the transformation chain for which there isn't typically market data available. And there may be market market data available uh, for that same mineral at a different point in the transformation chain. Uh, so we're not intending to, to put out an, another toolkit on this particular aspect. The one last week contained a lot of that information, but we are certainly intending to uh, take forward some of these strands of work and to use the analysis that we have already done and the analytical process that we have come up with uh, th through, through a number of other different strands of work. And I know, for instance, that we're working uh, a little bit more on, on a couple of additional case studies uh, specifically relating to bauxite and rough diamonds. Thank you, Melinda. Another question related to uh, non-CIV funds. So the question is focused on, on, on the consequences of the MLI and what will be done. Difficult question. No easy answer. We're working on that to try to provide either more example or more clarity. There were a few examples published uh, recently uh, in order to describe the situation. We understand that the industry is not that happy uh, uh, because there is some worry. I mean, there would be no change through the MLI, but some countries worry that some companies, uh, non-CIV funds, worry uh, about that. So we, we will keep working on that, but beyond what can be done in the pure tax treaty work area, I would like uh, that Arim shares with you what we intend to do as regard trace, which may be a way to facilitate cross-border investments and reducing withholding taxes, which could help CIV funds as well as non-CIV funds. Arim. Thank you. Yes, all of that in, in one minute uh, briefly. Uh, there has been, I think, through the various uh, pieces of guidance, a recognition in the industry that increasingly knowing the residence of the investor will be increasingly important for purposes of treaty entitlement of the asset pooling vehicle. I think that's probably even more pronounced for the non-CIV funds as it is compared to the CIV funds. Now, we've worked on and we have a package, the so-called Trace One, um, that seeks to address the issue of treaty relief given the complicated holding structures and the intermediate holding structures that we see in the way that cross-border portfolio investments and securities are being held. Now, that was also developed in the area before the CRS. Now, we have the CRS implementations, which we think should facilitate some of those systems that could then be used 
to address those issues, those issues that have always been present, those issues also for the CIV, and then also exploring and taking them um, into the non-CIV space and seeing what we can do, reconciling the legitimate interest of those investing in those, whether it's uh, pension funds, etc., with the legitimate interest of source country to make sure that they get the right amount of source taxation. So we will explore this further. There is elements such as the CRS or the common transmission system that I've mentioned that allows to stream information to source countries. There's a lot of things on which we can now build. And so we will explore that and hopefully be able uh, to report back to you and where this is taking us. Thank you, Hakim. Uh, we have a, a few other questions which have not been answered very quickly. Uh, uh, a question on the U.S. and the fact that the U.S. didn't sign the, the MLI, the multilateral instrument. What's the impact on the MLI? Actually, not much, because the U.S. is known for not having treaties with tax havens or with zero tax jurisdictions or with treaty shopping hubs. Or when they have a treaty with a country which could be used uh, for uh, treaty shopping purposes, they have a very stringent LOB provision, limitation of benefits provision, which means that the U.S., probably meets the standard of Action 6 and didn't need to sign the MLI, but other countries didn't need the US to sign the MLI for the treaty network to be protected. And as a result of that, we can say that the US not signing is not a big deal. Well, some could say, and I would too, uh, that uh, on Action 7, it could have been useful that the US would join, but you will have seen that a number of countries have made some reservations here, so things are not yet stabilized. That's related to the permanent establishment. I would say it's a pity for the US to actually miss the opportunity to get arbitration with a number of countries. 25 or six countries have signed on arbitration, and the US could have actually got that uh, provision uh, in, in uh, effect with that many countries. So it's a bit of a pity that they didn't sign. It's not the new administration which decided not to. It's the previous administration, their decision. No impact on the others, no impact on leveling the playing field. Last question was, uh, not the last one, but the last one we can address now, was about the European Union listing exercise, whether we are cooperating with the European Commission. Indeed, we are coordinating as much as we can. A number of uh, the uh, peer reviews or the uh, criteria taken by the uh, European Union are fully aligned with what Monica is doing. So the European Union will follow what Monica and her team, the Global Forum, are doing uh, in terms of assessment. As regards harmful tax practices, we are not uh, listing countries on that basis at the OECD, the European Union will, but uh, most of the work will be outsourced, I'm not sure the term would be agreed, but uh, will be done by the harmful tax practices forum of the inclusive framework so that countries can be there on an equal footing. There is just the element so-called 2-2, which is about uh, no tax jurisdiction, which is not yet 100% clear from our perspective on what would trigger uh, a listing exercise there, <clears throat> and we will be looking into this. We are coming to an end uh, of this webcast. We wish you a good summer. We will not break uh, here, but uh, uh, the teams will keep working so that à la rentrée, as we say in French, in September, we could uh, meet again with you through that webcast to update you on what's the program of work uh, uh, till the end of the year. The team by then will be enriched uh, by uh, new people who are joining us. I can uh, make it public. It was, I think, announced last week. Tomas Balko uh, from the Slovak Republic, who is, I think, well known in the international uh, tax uh, arena, is joining the team as the head of the uh, transfer pricing uh, unit, uh, and we will soon have, we cannot make it public now, but uh, we will soon have a new head of the um, uh, tax treaty team to replace, even though he cannot be replaced, Jacques Sasville, we wish him good luck, uh, but we will have a person starting the 1st of September coming from uh, the government too. We needed someone who is well uh, uh, tuned with working party one, uh, but we'll make the announcement, uh, this announcement public very soon. Thank you for listening. Thanks to the team which has prepared the webcast, which has participated to the webcast, and to the teams which are be, be behind us working very hard to deliver some significant changes in the international tax area. Thank you very much, and enjoy the summer. <laughs>